greatest gifts to the body of Christ is the kingdom of God. We never look at it like that, but the kingdom is a gift from God to all of us. A lifestyle management system that when plugged into really makes us a whole different being. The truth of the kingdom is that it doesn't come from observation, but Jesus says the kingdom is within us. And therefore the kingdom gets in us by our allowing truths to get into our lives and those truths transform us. He said that you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. The Lord would never have you live in bondage to any person, place, or thing. He would never have you in bondage to old ways of life, but often we find ourselves there. Truths that transform are just some things that I'm sharing that will really build your life and edify you, exhort you and encourage you into a greater place of living and a greater way of seeing God and his kingdom. Truths that transform will touch your life in deep places and allow you to walk in the value that you know that God has ordained for your life. Be encouraged, take care. Join me, Truths to Transform. Peace. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter. Uh, Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter. We welcome all of you to Life Center today where, where Jesus is Lord. And those of you that, uh, well, we had some overflow, but I think they moved most of them in here. Uh, thank God for all of you um, being being here today and uh, hearing my heart as I express some things about us uh, remaining as a congregation, uh, as one congregation and not becoming splintered in these times. Uh, I, I, I want to talk regarding giving because you you did so well and, and I want to applaud you because we hit a period where you weren't doing so good and then even two weeks before tabernacle offering you started giving like you used to give and then this past Sunday for tabernacle you you gave tremendously and uh, that's a testament to your own growth and to your maturity and so what I want to do is continue to build out our giving grace because I don't like visiting that, especially when we're streaming to an international audience. It, it, we go on the limb and when you do this, you begin to present your business to people online who some are concerned about your ministry and, and some don't care about your ministry. And what we want to do is, is, is be a mature group of believers and giving is a part of that. Attendance is a part of that. Uh, and so I want to help us continue in, in, in this giving grace because you're doing well. And I don't want you to stop uh, because the tendency, once we do things for God and feel like God accepts it or is pleased with it, we all have a tendency to then somehow drop back. It's, it's, it, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, the tendency is there. I, you know, I, I go through seven days of fasting. Okay, well, I gave God seven days. I'm going to take a break. And then, you know, three days after that, you're back into something, into a mindset or a habit because we, send, we, we, we seem to perform. That's why the anointing can be different, difficult, rather. You can have an anointing on your life to do something, but after you do that thing, Samson, you can find yourself in a place where your strength doesn't work because you move away from God. You know, it's making sense. And so I don't want you to do that in your giving because I realize how important giving is to God. It's important to God, but it's important to God for your benefit. Because what the Lord is doing is just checking to see where your where your treasure is. Because where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. And often our giving is not our treasure. Things we give to are our treasure. Things we hold on to money, God's money, those are our treasure. Areas in our lives where we don't align with God, it's because somewhere idolatry has seeped into our life and idolatry is a mean spirit. 
because all it wants to do is take you away from God and God's stuff. And, and, and that's why my, my desire is not just to preacher you and preach to you, but to father you and impart to you so that you would have strength when you get into challenging times, not just some catchy phraseology to hold on to. How you doing? Blessed. Well, you need to look like it, act like it, and do like it. Don't just say it. But those are phraseologies that we that we use. They ain't fair. But you're not showing it. You know, and, and, and these things are often because we don't press into God and stay with God long enough. One, one spirit has to be broken off of this ministry. Um is is the is 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 that we don't last long. We don't last long. I'm not speaking this, but I do want you as leaders in the body of Christ to make an observation. Look around at who's in here this week, and you may be surprised to see them next week. Because we have a tendency to please flesh, to please man, to please apostle. Please, please don't get me in that. Many good men and women have fallen because their congregations have raised them up and listened to them more than they listen to God. And I don't want to fall because I've got a whole group of people who are responding to me and not responding to God. You understand what I'm saying? We, we don't, we don't want to be that casualty in the kingdom that I'll do it because apostle said it. Because my reading is only of apostle. My reading is not of the word. So I don't go back as far as to the word. I go back as far to flesh. And flesh will, will frustrate you. I will disappoint. I offend somebody every week that I know of. That I know of. Those are the ones I know of. And they email me and they text me. And apostle, you said this and you, and you said that. And, and I said, yeah, I did. Um, but I, I'm going to offend you righteously. I'll probably offend you unrighteously. Um, that's why you, 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 you got to match what I say to the word and become mature disciples in the word to do the word, not do apostle. We grew up in the age of bragging on our preacher. That's why I don't like nobody introducing me as a great apostle. And, and, and giving me all this applause and, and all this stuff. I, I don't need it. I, I don't need it a bit. I need support, but I, I don't need to be lifted up as, as though I'm this big guy in the sky. I don't, I don't need that. It, really, it doesn't work for me. I was in here a few weeks ago and I was doing one teaching on a Wednesday night and I read my resume. And it's hot. I, I don't need people following me to think that it makes me feel good. I've already been made to feel good through my resume. I've accomplished a lot. Things I didn't know God was doing and things I knew God was doing. And so we don't want to be a church that follows after flesh. And so don't, don't be here this week. And then get back into, well, I ain't showing up for about three weeks or three months. or six. Because that's, you, you, you're not doing this for me. You're doing it for God. I'm just God's messenger to communicate. So the same thing with giving. I, I want to help you get into a place where you're obedient in your giving. And, and where your faith is strong enough that you don't allow, what I'm getting ready to read in a few moments, you don't allow what's going on around you to take from God, not God, not God. And, and, and whether you are a church goer or not, you, you don't want to take from God, nothing. So look, look at Ecclesiastes, and I read this last week in our message, chapter 11, verse four through six. It says, he who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Now, often what happens with our money 
is we give according to the conditions that are going on in our life. But have you ever wondered that if I were obedient, maybe I wouldn't see these conditions? So why move from the defensive when I can move from the offensive? Why, why go to the doctor and get a bad report when you can just quit eating sweets? You know, why not just do it up front so you don't have to do it on the backside, right? So, so with giving, you, you don't wait on perfect conditions to get anything done because you'll never do anything. There is never a perfect condition to give to God. Why? Because there's always something going on in your life. And there's always something around the corner. But if I'm the widow, I'd rather give to the prophet not knowing that my son's going to die and I'm going to need him to resurrect him. But let me get seed in the ground so that now the prophet is apt to move on my behalf because I seeded up front. Okay, not this, I'm talking about God. You know, let, let, let me go ahead and, and do what I should do up front so I'm not trying to catch up. Because, you know, there, there is a penalty for not tithing. How many of you have ever given 20%? A little more than 20%, actually. How many of you have ever done that? Most of us not. Most of us haven't made up what we haven't get, gotten, and we got to repent for that. Because something's owed what you don't give when you're supposed to. The world calls it fees. Where do you think they got it from? Everything comes from God. That's where the world got it from. And so we, we, want, we want to stay up front and be offensive and not wait because it says that he who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable, you won't sow. Well, I got this going on. I got that going on. I got, when have you not had it going on? And whether you are making $100,000 a year or $50,000 or $20,000 a year, you going to still have stuff going on. But we can't pull back from God because we've got stuff going on. That's when you give to God to keep more stuff from happening. He says in verse 5, As you know not what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a pregnant woman, we don't know these things. He says, Even so, you know not the work of God who does all. Look at me. I don't know how my return is going to come back to me spiritually, physically, mentally, financially when I give to God. I, I never know. I don't, no one knows. But here's what I know. I know it will. Because it always has. And God is a God who does not lie because he's not like man. He doesn't repent. He doesn't change his mind. If he said, I will bless you for seeding, guess what he will do? Bless you for seeding to the measure that you see and will even go beyond that. But you and I have to understand that we don't know the work of God who does all. Well, he needs to hurry up. No, he just needs to be God. Why? Because waiting is building your patience. And you may not need patience for finances, but you may need pay patience for that little disobedient child. So while you're thinking money, God's saying, look, you, you, you're, you're waiting on me to do this. I, I'm setting some stuff up for you. And then you get weary and well-doing and you stop giving. Now you got to start all over. Who in here can afford to start over? None of us, especially not financially. Build and build and build and get in a good flow with God and something happened and we get afraid and we say, well, I can't give God because I don't think God can make it up. God? I don't think God can make it up? You, you just said nothing's too hard for him. Now guess what? You're going to be tested on that. Because persecution comes for what? 
sacred word. And when the words of God and principles of God come out, now that doesn't mean you're going to fail the test. It just means that, that, that what you've been wanting go come on sale at the same time you need to get it. It ain't always got to be, you know, oh God, he's going to wipe my family out. No. No, you, you just want a little weekend trip. And, 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 and Apostle says, well, Let's, can we give to the fishers? We And many of you said this in my Holy Ghost. I, we just gave extra last week. Did you breathe this week? You breathed last week too. What if God's, I'm going to limit their breath this week because, you know, I think they got enough air last week. We have to be practical in our understandings of God and look at the way we play games with God. And some of us actually think God doesn't see it. And so as we mature, we have to understand that as you know not what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a pregnant woman, you don't really know how a child is formed. In the same way, you don't know the works of God when you see, when you sow. You don't know what he's setting up for you. You don't know what door he's opening for you. You don't know the place that he's putting you. You don't know the things he's working down line for your grandchildren. You don't know the things he's doing in your family, in your mind, in your body. Many of us have been kept from things that, have, that, that could have killed us, that we never even knew about, but no one knows the works of God. And that's why we don't play with God because at any time his works could stop. Not that he's a mean God, he's trying to do that, but the more favor and grace and mercy we get from and with God, the more we stay in line with what God would have us to do to get more of it, and that's giving. And that's giving. I've already begun to hear great stories of return in giving, even in my own life. Even in my own life, because I'm always going to give, and I stretch myself in this last giving. So as we give today, let's not go back. Let's not go back. Let's activate our faith, which I'm going to talk about a little later. 12 o'clock, ain't going to happen. I'm going to talk about a little later, and we're going to build our faith even more, but you're going to see how what you do today is pleasing to God. So let, let's uh, let's all of us give. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're declaring that these decrees that we make when we when we seed God, the decrees that we made last week, I declare that every one of them is so. And with you being the Lord of the earth and all of the fullness that Lord, you are going to manifest wealth to us in all aspects of our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will so cover the seeds and that you will manifest God for those who give cheerfully and are excited about giving and not worried about it because you love a cheerful giver. Father, let cheerfulness be our portion today that we give cheerfully so you recognize it and you work in it. Father, we will be obedient to cheerful giving today and forever because we realize by now you're not taking anything away from us. You're trying to get everything to us that you can that we would have a greater level of life and living. So Father, let those who didn't see it in the tabernacle last week, let them be honest to that and give. Let those who used to tithe, but have stopped tithing, let tithing start again today for them. And those who haven't tithed, God, I declare new tithers come forth in obedience to God and the love that he has shown them. We call these seeds blessed. We declare supernatural signs and wonders come from them even in our spirit man. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let us give. If you're giving online, just go to our website and tap the giving button, and uh, we'll be glad to receive your seed and it's prayed over. And we're trusting the Lord works and moves in all of our lives, not just financially, but in every aspect in our giving. And the church said, amen. Let us see.
Elder Lanyetta. Amen. All right, turn your Bible to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, again, we're talking about the supernatural. I wanted to get into some of this teaching last week, but was unable to. Uh, we had a great move of God that shifted us uh, in our direction where we were going, so I uh, was unable to do that. But turn to Ephesians 4. Uh, and now, I hope that you have gone back and visited the message from last week. If you haven't done it, let's, let's start making that a practice where we go back out of six days. You've got six days between now and Sunday. Find one day to go back and listen to the message. It's on our YouTube page uh, for Life Center International. Go back, listen to the message, glean from it so that when you come in here, you're ready to go, and I don't have to do a lot of review. I do a lot of review just to get everyone on the same page and getting us flowing into what I'm about to talk about so that we won't be completely lost. But it takes a lot of time, and I, I, I don't like the time that I take to minister. It's just going to draw things out in the January and February. But if we will, because I have to keep going over things, but if we can learn and study while we are apart, uh, it will help us when we come in here on Sunday morning. Just like we've talked about that when we come together corporately, we want to come in ready for worship. This morning, you are ready for worship because we need glory to tap the supernatural dimension. It, has, it works together. And when you create this type of atmosphere where God can habitate, things will happen without the laying on of hands. Things will happen without prophecy. Things will happen without us having to teach a particular subject. They'll just happen because God's presence is in here and doing things. And it's the same for those of you that are viewing. If you create a home of God's glory, you will experience God's glory more than you know it. You will feel the presence of God as you're walking. This morning I came in here before and, and me and God just danced on the stage together. And it was as though Jesus was holding my hand and we were just waltzing together. I don't know what they call it in heaven. But we were just waltzing together. I, and I could feel his presence and the joy. I could feel his joy while we were dancing together. Well, that's where we should live. That should be happening all the time with us. So let's learn to study and grow and, and learn. Now, today I'm going to get into some real technical stuff. I thought I was last week, but I didn't get there. But today I'm going to get in some real technical stuff, and I'm going to need you to, uh, uh, to get a pad and a pen or make sure you're going back to study these things that I'm talking about. Repeat this with me. I am living, relating to an order of existence beyond the visible universe. In this kingdom walk, 
I am departing from what is usual or normal, especially via the transcending of the laws of nature. So, so what, what, where I'm living in the supernatural is that there are laws of nature that people in the natural feel cannot be violated. But in the supernatural, I move and transcend those laws of nature. A law of nature is what goes up must come down. In the supernatural, it can go up and never come down. See what I'm saying? So, so, so in the supernatural, you break the laws of nature. Things that should not happen, happen because I'm living supernaturally, because supernatural things are flowing through my life. This is the mention that we want to live in and what we just confess that we're living in. Say, I am tapping into a dimension that is attributed to an invisible agent. So we cannot move in the supernatural without Holy Spirit. Now, those of you that need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can come up here after the gathering and we, will, we would love to do ministry with you and get that gift to you. You cannot live in power without Holy Spirit. And a lot of us don't that have Holy Spirit don't live in power because we don't activate Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit will sustain you and restrain you and lead you and give you secrets and revelation and wisdom and knowledge that are far beyond anything you could get in the natural. And so you and I have to activate Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is the strength that governs our lives. And when we let him govern our lives, he changes the ball game. So he takes you above and beyond normal living. You were not born and birthed in the spirit to live normal. You were birthed to live by the spirit of God. So say this, I'm learning, I'm expecting, and I'm living out of the supernatural. Now, we talked about how the supernatural realm and one of its levels of an, or meaning or one, one value to it is that the supernatural has been put in place to really demolish whatever blockades exist in the world. Go back and look through the Bible and look at the problems that people had. They were blockages. They were hindrances. But what happened? A supernatural occurrence happened. Something supernatural happened at the Red Sea. There hasn't been a sea that parted since the Red Sea because it was a supernatural thing. Why? Because of a hindrance, because of a blockage. The Jericho Wall, because of a hindrance, because of a blockage. The workings of signs and wonders and miracles in people's lives as Jesus walked the earth. People who had leprosy, people who were blind, people who were deaf. Those were blockages that only the supernatural can open up. And so if you've got blockages and hindrances in your life, and I know you do because you're living in the earth, which is a sinful world, and because of sin, that's why we have issues. If you're living your life and you've got blockages and hindrances, why well, think that's a normal way of life? Because that's what mommy and daddy told me. Because that's what preachers of old told me. Because that's how I've lived my life before, just believing, well, that's the way it is, that's the way it's going to be. I don't have to tolerate stuff in my body, my mind, my finances, my relationships, my marriage, my, 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 my business, my job. I don't have to tolerate that. So why? Because I live in a supernatural realm. Stop complaining about your boss and get to work before they do and pray some supernatural prayers. Stop complaining about, oh, this person bothers me and get in the spirit and cut them off. You and I already have the solve for anything that bothers us because the supernatural destroys hindrances. But if you want to hold on to hindrances, then keep getting gray, keep getting wrinkled, keep getting upset, tumors, ulcers, no peace, anxiety, because instead of tapping into a supernatural realm where this stuff can be abolished, I'm entertaining it and holding on to it because something feels good to hold on to my misery. That ain't the kingdom. And I don't care what happened to you. There is a supernatural way of God emotionally that can restore you and build you and strengthen you and advance you. 
the challenge is that, that, that there are people around you who have been through and came out of what you're in supernaturally, but you're trying to be private and it's written all over your face. <laughs> Folks see you. And they're trying to help you, but you and your, how you doing? Blessed. How you doing? It's a mess. And you got folk around you who want to come in agreement. They're supernatural with your supernatural and manifest some supernatural outcomes and get us out of these things that we're in and carrying and just somehow have believed, well, that's life. It might be life, but it ain't God's life. And we want God's life. See, I, 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 I got to get going because I can stay up in this stuff a long time. Hear this. Hear me. Who God is and what Christ did was all fueled by the supernatural. It wasn't once in a while. It was always fueled by the supernatural. So in order to, to, to tap into the supernatural, say this. You got to have awareness. You got to have awareness of the fact that God is supernatural. I'm in a supernatural dimension called salvation called life in Christ. So I must have an awareness of that so that when I start to think and act natural, I'll be aware that, no, I've got a supernatural dimension I can tap into. And so every day I have to make a decision on everything. Do I deal with it naturally or do I deal with it supernaturally? Well, I've been dealing with most things naturally all my life and they haven't borne fruit. So let me shift and change the game and start moving supernaturally. And start pulling on the supernatural dimension to bring those things that are unseen into seen. So say awareness. Then there has to be thirst. There has to be a thirst for God. That's what I was hoping and that's what we did this morning. Stir up in many of you a thirst for God. A hunger for God. Wanting to taste and see how good the Lord is. David loved being in the sanctuary because it allowed his thirst to get filled. I don't think it can ever get quenched. Because once it gets quenched, guess what? You get thirsty again. And once it gets quenched, you get thirsty again. So thirst will continue to come. And so there, but there has to be a desire inside of all. Of, I just want Jesus. I just want the glory of the Lord. I want the presence of God. I want the kingdom of God. I want to be with God. I, I want to be around him. I don't want to wait to Sunday. I don't, I, I want to be able to have a move of God in my own house, in my own car. In my bathroom, two moves of God. I just want to move a God wherever I am. And hear this. And I even want to be that move of God. See, you, you get in the way with stuff when you tell people you went to church. Because if I was them, I would say, and what happened? You see? Church ain't just about, I went to church. It's about what happened. What broke out. How did Holy Spirit move? Turn to Ephesians 4. Because many fear the move of Holy Spirit. Verse 30, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Many fear the move of Holy Spirit. And in fearing the move of Holy Spirit, they quench Him. They block Him. I said this last week. Fear will keep you from moving in the spirit. Fear will keep you. Understand, y'all, giving is spiritual. Fear will keep you from giving. Fear will keep you from serving. Fear will keep you from saying, I'm sorry to people. Fear will keep you from so many things that are normal in the kingdom of God because I'm afraid of what will happen if I move in the spirit so it, because it's unlimited, so let me stay in the natural so I can now control and dictate what goes on around me. And y'all, we got to be honest. We are control freaks. All of us. And we'll call somebody a Jezebel. Oh, they just so controlling. Well, you're trying to control them and they won't work. And that's why you call them a Jezebel. Now, we just as controlling as anybody we call controlling. And who do we try to control? Jesus. Look at Ephesians 4.30. What does it say? But here's the deal right here. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't offend or vex or sadden him. How do we offend or vex or sadden him? 
when we won't let his dimension flow through us, when we don't become aware, when we're not thirsty, and we don't become a demonstration, we grieve Holy Spirit, whom you were sealed, Mark branded as God's own secured for the day of redemption of final deliverance through Christ from evil and consequence of sin. Even look at 1 Thessalonians, the 5th uh, chapter in the 19th verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. It also says, do not quench Holy Spirit. Don't suppress him or subdue him. When I, when I have the gift of speaking in tongues and I won't do it, I'm suppressing him. Now, remember, he is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three different functions, one person. Okay? He is God. And so when I suppress him because I won't let what he wants to do flow out of me, I am grieving him. And God says, don't you grieve Holy Spirit. Don't quench him. Don't stop him. Don't, don't oppress him. Don't subdue him. Don't quiet him. Don't try to get him under control. Now, some churches are too quiet. Some churches are too loud. Which means some churches are quieting him and some are grieving him. That's why we want to be a balanced people. We want to be balanced in the kingdom. Why y'all play the music y'all play? Because we're trying to be balanced. Because there ain't no colored section in heaven. Right? Ain't no white section in heaven. Ain't no Hispanic section in heaven. So we got to learn to bring it all in. Bring it all in. Bring it all in. Like, 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 I'd like to invite you to church and you don't look like me. Bring it all in. So God is saying to us that I want you to be a balanced people. Don't, don't quench me. Don't do too much and don't do too little. But find the balance. How do we find the balance? He's the balance. How does he want to move? When does he want to move? How does he want to do things? And we move in that, but we don't suppress him. Oh, I don't, I, I don't want no gift from God. I don't want no gift to no Holy Ghost. It's God giving you a gift. We, we don't even turn down gifts from people. You know who to sweeten up around in the October going into November because it's getting close to Christmas? Because we want gifts. Hey, girl. Child, I'm just thinking about you. I ain't, I ain't seen you since last time at Christmas. We, we know who to sweeten up to get gifts. God wants to give you this gift of Holy Spirit so you can move in the power of Holy Spirit and not walk around looking mean and mad and upset and bothered because I'm tapping into the joy of the Lord and the fruit of the Spirit and that's working in me, not my flesh. So what's God doing? I said last week he's raising up a generation of pioneers who want to enter into a higher dimension in God. He's raising up pioneers. He's raising up men and women who, 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 have, who realize that they've gone as far as they can go with just same old church stuff. That's what, and, and there's nothing wrong with realizing that. Okay? So what God wants to do is help you to get, help us get as a corporate body into another dimension of living and life where you can enjoy what you got saved for. Right? I mean, none of us got saved to have a boring, mundane, oppressed, living on the bottom, never happy and excited, never having a lot of fun. You know, to, we didn't get saved to be under something. We got saved to be above things and to put things under our feet so we can live the quality of life that Jesus died for. So let's get, let's get technical. Turn to Romans 1. Let's, let's, let's get technical because there's a path to the supernatural that begins with faith. There's a path to the supernatural that begins with faith. There's a path to the supernatural that begins with faith. Look at Romans 1, okay? Now, hear this, listen, listen. Faith has to be constantly activated to please God. Faith has to be constantly activated 
to please God. Now, again, we're not just talking about the supernatural of that. I'm talking about speaking to you, caring for you, being nice to you, loving you. That requires faith to do. Okay? So, faith has to be constantly activated. The Word of God is full of faith. Things I should step into by faith. So anything I do, I must do by faith. So faith, as we talk about this supernatural realm, has to be constantly activated to please God and if we're going to see supernatural things happen in our lives. I want to come in here and just see supernatural things happen all the time. I want to hear during the course of the week supernatural things happening all the time. I just want to see you, see you talking to each other, sharing about the supernatural things that happen. We come in here and we enjoy one another, but we're talking about the supernatural things that happen while we were away from each other. No one's a big I, no one's a little you. They're all important, they're all valuable, they're all demonstrating the love of God, the power of God, the glory of God. But I want you to get into a place where you are expecting, you have an awareness of the supernatural. When I go in a grocery store, I don't want it to be the same grocery store trip for you. Going to the car wash, I don't want it to be the same car wash trip for you. I want something to happen. Something needs to happen wherever you go. Why? Because I'm supernatural. I got a supernatural dimension in me, which hear this. Holy Spirit is looking for stuff to get you into. <laughs> It got quiet up in here on that one. I just want to go to the mall, mind my business, get in and get out. I just want to go in my neighborhood, drive the car down the road, check the mailbox, get back in the car, come back home and cook. But the supernatural's trying to get you into stuff. Holy Spirit is saying, Psst, let's get into something. See that woman over there? Mm -mm. <laughs> See that bad acting child? Where, Lord? Because I ain't trying to get into nothing. I'm just trying to go through life in my Christian closet and watch the world and people around me's lives be destroyed and, 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 and destructive and destructive. And I don't want nothing to come out of me that can help them. So, Lord, just give me a pass. Hebrews 11, 6 tells us that without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible Faith is the economy of the kingdom of God. Faith moves the kingdom. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But don't none of y'all look at me. You ever found anybody just impossible to please? Don't look this way. Don't look this way. You, you ever met anybody? It's just impossible to please them. Well, imagine God when you don't use faith. It's impossible to please. Him. And how do you feel with people who don't please you? Right? God loves you. He's here for you. But look, he ain't got no tolerance for not pleasing him. So if I'm going to please God, it requires what? Come on, y'all, we got company. If I'm going to please God, it requires what? It requires faith. It requires faith to please him. Romans 1, 17. It says, For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed through the way of faith that arouses to more faith. As it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. Look, look at this. It says, it says, for in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, 
For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes. There's a righteousness that God ascribes to people. Well, how do we know about this righteousness? It's revealed and it springs forth from faith. We are saved by grace through what? Faith. Our faith saves us. We believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. We believe that, 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 that He is the, the Lord of the earth. We, 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 we believe that He died and was resurrected. Our salvation is sealed in that. Okay? We believe that by faith. Has anybody in here, other than a dream of visiting a visitation, seen Jesus? No. We didn't live when this was happening. But by faith, we believed it. There are people you know that don't have the faith to believe the gospel of Jesus. Okay? But somehow, God worked something in you that you had the faith. He worked it in them, they haven't tapped into it. You had the faith to believe in a man you'd never seen. I ain't talking about online dating. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean to get in your business. <laughs> Where was I? Uh, yeah. The scripture. Both springing from faith and leading to faith. So, so my righteousness, which is ascribed from God, is revealed from the faith and it leads to more faith that arouses more faith. And it's written that those who walk by faith, by, by, uh, through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by that faith. So, so from, from this text, what do we find out? We find out that faith is a process. Say faith is a process. Now, I say process because process is a word used to describe a series of steps. A series of steps that are taken to reach an end. There's a place that God wants to take you to, and to get there, it requires what? Faith. But it is a process. Because the faith that you have, hopefully now, was not the faith you had at salvation. And the faith that you had three years in is not the faith you've had at ten years in. Which that's a lot of the challenge I was talking about in our giving because we are seasoned givers. We've been in church long enough to know what belongs to God and what doesn't. So we shouldn't have to go over the elementary principles again. Why? Because through our journey, God has proven himself that he will take care of me if I've got a lot or a little. So I have to go through a process, which is a series of steps, that are taken to reach an end. That's the way faith works. So Romans 117 tells us that there is a righteousness that springs forth from faith. Hear this. And when we participate with the process, what do we do? We activate faith. If I give up when trouble hits, I deactivate faith. Right? But if I look at whatever's coming against me, whatever I got to deal with and say, I'm tapping into my faith. Not in me, but in God. Not into somebody who's always got the hookup for me, but for God. I'm tapping into my faith in God. Listen to this. And when I tap into that faith, guess what it does? It leads me to greater faith. And when I tap into that faith, what does it do? It leads me to greater faith. Which means if you've been saved more than six, seven years, you ought not be worried about squat ever. That's the Cheryl Murphy version. How long will you worry? Or should I say, how long will you reject God's process of faith building in you? And if you figure this out, the more I don't move in the process, the more I got to go through. Tell yourself, stay in the process. 
Why? Because life comes at you fast. And the wall of the adversary is to get you so discombobulated that you drop faith and pick up whatever he wants you to pick up and do whatever he wants you to do because I dropped my faith. God says, don't do this, but I still went and did it because I dropped faith in the word of God, which is my, 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 my guiding light for my life. Say this, say my faith, when activated, arouses more faith. My faith, when activated, arouses more faith. My faith, when activated, arouses more faith. So, so here, I'm, I'm going real kingdom on you. I should want more stuff that requires my faith so I can access faith and have a greater shot at the supernatural showing up. Because I'm tapping faith, and when I tap faith, more faith comes from. The more I use it, the more aroused it becomes. It wants me to use it. Because without using it, I'm never pleasing to God. Faith is like any living organism. It must be nurtured to grow. Do y'all ever wonder why people quit on God? They in a while, they out a while. They in a while, they out a while. They in a while, they out a while. You know why they quit on God? Because they have no faith. Or they won't activate their faith. Faith, like any other organism, a living organism, it must be nurtured. So how does it get nurtured? By problems. By situations. By circumstances. They come so my faith can get nurtured. They're like water to my faith. They're like dirt to my faith. They are the antidote for the next level. So they come so that I am not 12 years in the kingdom still in my diapers. And that's one of the biggest challenges in the body of Christ is just the immaturity of the people. I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. I want, I want this. I want that. I want that. You don't have faith. I'm not saying faith to get it. I'm saying faith to steward it once you get it. How, how many of you have, to, if you're parents, how many of you have to have faith to steward your children? Show you right. Show you right. You got to have faith. So anything you get, it requires faith to steward it. Because the opposite of faith is doubt. And if I doubt it, I won't nurture it and it will die. How many people have doubted their children and gave up on them? Because they never arouse faith inside of them. Faith that says, I don't care what the boy is acting like. The boy going to be an apostle one day. I know he the baddest acting thing in the neighborhood. But the boy going to be somebody one day. I had a great aunt that says, Terrell's going to be the first pastor in the family. And he's ready to stone the prophet. I told them all, hold, don't hold your breath while I lit up. But somebody had faith. Luke 5 foot 2, Meemaw, Emma Murphy, had faith. And, and, and stayed with me. And my dad stayed with me. And other people surrounded me and stayed with Because they saw something in me by faith that I was supposed to become. And many of you have the same story. It's faith that somebody had in you that increased as you got worse. As you got worse. You need to just leave him alone. I can't leave him alone. And I, there's something about I, I can't I can't leave him alone. Because something in me is bearing witness that this boy going to be something. 
this girl going to pull her skirt down and beat somebody. Don't be afraid to have your faith challenged. Played football in college, walked on at the Appalachian State University. The. Got there seven days later than all the freshmen, 10 days later than all the other players because I was a walk-on and walk-ons could not come in with the regular team. So I had to come in 10 days late to practice. We worked out in gym shorts. They said, you got some skill. We're going to give you a shot to make the team. I was playing defensive back at that time. I wasn't playing wide receiver. So I'm playing defensive back. And, 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 and I knew I could play, and I knew I could make that team. I, I scouted all the other DBs that they had signed, and I'm like, they're wasting money. They just wasted taxpayers' dollars signing these jokers. I knew I could play better. And so I remember one day, it was the running back, I mean, the defensive backs going against the running backs. And I remember just standing in line, one line was over there, one line was over here. I remember standing there, and it's all like God, in the way he does things, just allowed me to look at the defensive back coach. And I looked at the defensive back coach, and he was telling the running back coach, he was going, he was telling him to switch places in line between two guys because I was coming up and he was high on me and wanted to see what I could do. So here I am, five, eight and a half, 170 pounds. And, and, and I remember they put me up against, he switched like that. And, and I had to go up against a guy named Dean Lynch from Kingsport, Tennessee, one in the Tennessee area. And Dean Lynch was 6'1", 245 pounds, fullback. My faith was challenged. And so, so I'm in position. I take my read step. He swings out of the backfield. Here I come. I knocked the fool out of Dean Lynch. He challenged my faith. I refused to run from Goliath. I chose to run to Goliath. And I hit that dude so hard that on that day I became T Murph. And T Murph will knock the sugar honey iced tea out you. That, that's what it was about T Murph. T, T Murph will bring it. T Murph will bring it. Weeks later, I'm on full scholarship for the rest of my years in college. Hear this. When they switched them, I could have switched with somebody too. And some of you want somebody else's journey. And God's got you in what you're in so your faith can be challenged. And don't you dare try to switch places with somebody because you don't know what God is calling you to realign and bring your anointing to. And the fruit of that was a free education. There's always something on the backside of our faith if we will allow the process and not be afraid of being challenged. Look at somebody say, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged. You're challenged right now because you're like, it's 6 till 12. We need to be out of here. Where's your faith? That the food's still going to be there when you get to the restaurant. Where's your, oh yeah, little faith. I'm just getting started. Say this, I will not be afraid to have my faith challenged. And see, you can't be afraid to exercise your faith. If not, it will never grow and not using it will cause you to be displeasing to God. And you'll live a settle for waiting on God and, and uh, kind of life when God's waiting on you.
God says, here, take that. Now I'm waiting on you. Here, take that issue. Now I'm waiting on you. I put something in you before the foundation of the world to deal with what I'm allowing in your life. Now I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to tap into faith, the economy of the kingdom, the pillar for the supernatural. Well, I don't never see nothing supernatural. Do you ever tap into faith? Do I ever believe beyond what I can believe? You were birthed into a supernatural dimension. If God only wanted you living in a natural dimension, he would have never given you faith. He gave you faith to live in a supernatural dimension. Susan put something on my desk the other day because I didn't uh, I didn't show up for court. Because my car wanted to go faster than me. And see, she said, you, you, you got a letter upstairs. And, and like a school teacher, she wrote on it, very important. <laughs> then highlighted it. Me and God watching football Saturday. And she's, because he wasn't ready to work on the message. So I said, well, let's watch the game together. <laughs> so she she leaned over down and the, off the balcony and said, got a letter up here. And then she looked at me because I gave her that look like, I ain't concerned about that letter. And, and, and then she walked away. And I said, okay, what's the letter about? So tell me, you know, basically, you don't pay this, you're going to jail. I said, I ain't, I ain't worried about this. I'm too busy to go to jail. I got, I got a kingdom to advance. I got time to go to jail. Do they not know who they sent the letter to? So I, I, I so after she left, she wasn't looking. I snuck in the office. And, and I didn't look at the letter. But then God just said, check your voice, man. So I checked my voice, man. And it was the Charlotte government telling me to disregard the letter. So, so. But I had faith that it was cool. And faith kept me cool. Be, 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 I, I, I just knew, and I'm going to get this in a minute. I just knew in my inner man it was okay. And that's what I could put my faith in. And she wasn't pulling for the government. She, was, she just knows that I will drag my feet on stuff. So I'm too busy to go to jail. So how do I gain victory over non-belief? By faith. Every visible thing that needs to make it into the visible needs faith. Someone needs to be healed and they're not healed. Their healing is in the invisible. Someone that needs breakthrough and don't have breakthrough, their breakthroughs in the invisible. Well, you and I have to become personally and for other people these conduits by which we believe that what's in the invisible will make its way into the visible. And when we lay hands on people, that's what we're doing. When we move in gifts of generosity towards people, that's what we're doing. We believe that we can do something that will meet a need and bring something from the invisible into the visible. We're just believing like that. Because we've seen God work. We know God does things. We know God is able and we believe that he is. What you and I have to do is learn to press forward and gain victory over any unbelief. Any held up thing that God has determined should be. We've got to learn to endure. We have to learn to press forward and gain victory over any unbelief. Don't try to tackle the issue if you ain't tackled your unbelief. Because what I believe is what's going to come out of me. 
It's not going to be, Lord, I declare, I decree and declare. It's going to be, Lord, I'm hoping you will if you kind of feel like you'd like to. If you ain't got nothing else to do, it'd be nice if you worked it out for me. And that's the way some of us pray. I know you're busy, Lord. I checked your schedule. But I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind. And could you? Because I know you got other things going on and other people more important to me. But I was just hoping and thinking and wondering, wishing and praying, Lord, that, that you would just look down on your poor little servant down here. And, 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 and Lord, just would you? Say this. Lord, grace me with divine ability to go beyond the natural realm. Lord, grace me with divine ability to go beyond what I see, what I hear, what I'm up against in the natural. Let me go beyond that into the spiritual. I seal it in Jesus' name. Faith is the conviction of a reality. When scripture tells us in Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of the reality, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Faith comprehends as fact, not as wondering, as fact. What cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Follow me here. This is vital. Because faith is number one, the assurance of things we hope for. Assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence. Faith is a positive declaration intended to give me confidence. That's why I have to speak right. That's why I should speak the word. That's why I should speak the principles of God and his kingdom because faith is a positive declaration that's intended to build my confidence. It's the proof of things not seen. Proof being the evidence or argument establishing or helping to establish a fact or a statement. Faith is evidence that what I'm thinking and feeling is being established as a fact, even though I can't see it. Go back and study this message. So how is what I positive how is what I positively declare established by faith? By my being assured, and in that I declare a fact. By my being assured, I declare a fact. I may not see the fact, but let's look at what faith is denied. I mean, what, what faith is, thirdly, it is the conviction of a reality. It's the conviction of a reality. It's the conviction of a reality. I can't see it, but I'm convicted of its reality. I'm telling you, I'm not, this, is, this is real technical. You got to go back and grow it and work it and get into it. Faith is the conviction of a reality. I can't see it, but I'm convicted of its reality. And then conviction communicates my firm belief. I'm saying what I believe because I'm convicted of the reality of it, even though I can't see it. I can't see it. How you know that? I'm just convicted of it. I just know it. Well, how do you know? I just know it. I'm convicted of it. So altogether, faith is, listen, an apostle Ted Sola says this, faith is the foundation where hope takes root and is established. So again, I have to have faith. I have to have faith. Because faith is where hope takes root roots if I have more time I talk about what faith is not I'm gonna do that next week we'll talk about what faith is not 
Today, I've just, I've just helped us to understand what faith is. And more than anything, it's this conviction that I have in me of something that I can't see, but it's a reality. We often live by the reality being what we can see. But faith deals in the unseen. That's why we need it. We need to have faith in order to move beyond those things that are trying to present themselves as things that we cannot overcome or move through. Now, raise your hands. Father, I'm declaring a download of faith for your sons and daughters. Faith, God. Not faith to manipulate you. Not selfish faith. But faith worked out that advances the kingdom of God. Faith that causes the purposes of the kingdom to come to pass in people's lives, in institutions, in neighborhoods, in cities, in nations, God. Now, faith, your word says, Father, is the substance of things hopeful. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Father, let there be a stirring of faith in your sons and daughters. And let their faith stir their faith, that greater faith. No matter what the circumstance, situation, happening is, God. Let them know what the truth of your kingdom is. And let them have faith to step into the reality of the kingdom. Not that which they are facing. Father, we need to grow in this area. Grace us with understanding. Grace us with insight. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, give us wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of you in this matter. How, how do you see this matter? How, how would you want us working through this matter of faith? Give us, God, the revelation. Give us the wisdom to operate in this dimension, in the knowledge of you, the way you do it. Teach us to walk by faith and not by sight. Father, I declare the garrison of the Lord around your sons and daughters, over all you put in their care and in their trust, over every matter and issue of their life. I declare them covered and kept, and the evil one toucheth them not. I declare, God, that as you are taking them through this faith process, they will come forth as pure gold. They will see you high and lifted up. They will know you like they've never known you before. They will dine with you and sup with you and learn your ways, God, on the journey that they are on. Father, they'll come forth with something greater than faith. They'll come forth with relationship with you. They'll come forth with an intimacy with you, God. They'll come forth as glory carriers because they've been in and lived in your presence, God. They'll come forth as instruments who can teach others to walk in faith. And Father, they will be recipients of the supernatural dimension, God, in the places where they live, the places where they work, in the places where they go and enjoy their lives, God. They will experience supernatural manifestation. And they will be quick to give glory and honor to you for it. And in the name of Jesus, God, I declare that the supernatural will be worked through them as you speak clearly to them, God, as to what to do and where to do it and how to do it and why to do it. Just as you gave Jesus instructions to open blinded eyes, just as you gave Jesus instructions of where to go that a person would be, just as you gave Jesus instructions of what to do to, to cast out devils, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, 
cleanse lepers. It shall be named among us, God, as a people who work not by power nor might, not for vain conceit or selfish ambition, not trying to make a name for ourselves, but fulfilling the portion that you have given to us through your goodness and through your love that we would be agents to bring light to people. Father, let a deeper measure of love be poured into all of us. Do new things in our heart, God. Grace us to love in new and better and more profound ways, Holy One. So that when we serve this generation, we do it in love. We do it for the sake of love. We don't do it to make a name for ourselves or to get ahead of anybody else or to draw attention to this ministry. We just do it, God, because of love. Everything you did was in love. Teach us to love. Help us to love. Show us how to love. Grace us to forgive and release anyone, anyone, anyone that we haven't released for anything they've done to us, against us, in any way, shape, or form. I declare the spirit of forgiveness manifest through you now. Let them go. 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 Release them. Don't block your power surge. Release them. No matter what they've said, no matter how they've acted, no matter how they've conducted themselves, release them. Let them go so love can flow through you. Have mercy on them, Father. But they know not what they did when they did that to me. I want to be a clear vessel, a clean vessel. I, I don't want any blockages to the ministry you're putting in me, Lord. It's happening right now. It's happening. As you're letting people go, God's filling you up. He's changing your spiritual stature even now. As you let people go, let them go. Let them go and mean it. Let them go and mean it. Let them go and act like it. Act like you've let them go. Let them go and act like it. Let them go. I had one of my students this morning here in the ministry tell me they had a teacher that was mean toward them. I said, be nice toward them. Let them go. Love them. Love them. Love them. Let it cover a multitude of their sins. Oh, I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord's presence. He's doing this work. He's doing this work. Come on, let them go. Let them go. Release them in the name of Jesus grace to you to let them go. There's no benefit in holding them down. It's just blocking the working of God's power in you. Ha, Shabbat. Ha. 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 Wash your people, God. Wash us. Wash away offense. Wash away offense. Wash away anger. Wash away the pain that it caused. Wash it away. Wash away the pain that it caused. Build your people, Father. Come on. He's building you into a new man, a new woman. He's building. Yeah. He's making you that vessel, that, that vessel that the supernatural can flow through. He's making you that vessel. Come on, believe by faith you're becoming a better person right now. Believe I'm becoming better by releasing others. I'm becoming better by receiving what the Lord has for me. I'm becoming better. I'm becoming stronger. 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 The Father. Pour into me a new level of power through my humility right now. Through my brokenness, let that be what builds me. In Jesus' name. I make room, room, room for you, for you. I make room. This is personal. Room. 
room for you to love through me. I make room. It's not congregational or it's not collectively, it's individually. I make room for you to love. I make room for you to hear me so that I will be a vessel to hear. I make room, I make room, I make room, room, room for miracles to flow through me. I make room for you to heal through me. I make room, I make room, room, room for love, oh love, for the agape love. You have for us. I just kept hearing the Father, even this morning when Apostle met with us, he kept using the word more. In Spanish, it means mas, mas, more, more, more of you. We need more of the glory of God. But we have to make room for him to come. See, we have to divest ourselves of some things. And that's what Apostle was telling us. We got, in order for God to fill an area, you have to empty it. You know, you can't put a new bed in a room that already has a bed. You have to move the bed out of the room to put the new room in, the new bed in. So you got to make room for him. We got to get rid of the clutter. Got to get rid of the clutter, the things we think we should keep for later. And, you know, what if I let go? What if I forgive them? Will God still deal with them? What if I don't let it go? He said, if you make room for me, I will sup with you. I will dine with you. I will restore, 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 restore. As you sit with me. I'll unveil mysteries as you sit with me. I'll unveil the mysteries. I will coach it as you make room for me. See, when we make room for him, he said, as you're sitting and supping with me, the angels are going and dealing with your daughter. The angels are going and adjusting that situation. The angels are going, and all you're doing is just sitting at his feet. All you're doing is sitting at his feet. He is doing the supernatural. The last thing the Lord told me, he said, the angels will do what you cannot do. But there is a part we do. And then the angels do what you cannot do. That there's a part. So when I say we make or I make room for him, I have to do that. I make room for him. That means time. That means prayer. That means the intimacy of worship when you're all by yourself. As you begin to worship in a new dimension by yourself, it's going to manifest right here. It's going to manifest in a new level. Because like I told you, you have that untapped well. You have an untapped well. So the last thing I'm going to say is, I make room for you. Room, room, room for you. 
King of King, Lord of Lord, I may grow. Say that with me. I may grow. This your response to him. I may grow. Come on, come on, say it again. I make room in your heart. I make room. Yeah. Amen. amen. The word of the Lord is yes and amen. Come on, put your hands together and bless Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we get ready to depart. If there are any of you that know that the Lord is calling you to join this ministry today or to give your life to Christ, ministers will be here, elders at the altar to receive you, pray for you, strengthen you, or whatever. But we would love to, to lead you and join with you in your salvation journey. Amen. They'll be here after this gathering. If you just need to talk to someone, they'll be here as well. Uh, two quick things, and we're going to depart. Number one, as they exit, Pastor, as you exit, uh, we have new cards made that you can use to invite people to uh, our worship gathering. Uh, Sundays, and it also has all of our social networking information on it as well. People who may not want to come into the building, but let's all take it upon ourselves to be uh, inviters in this harvest month. We want to invite people in this 10th month, the month of harvest. We want to invite people to worship with us. Let's come out of ourselves and deny ourselves and bless someone else's life so you can get cards as you leave. You'll see more information about this, uh, but o Occupy 2022 is going to, uh, will be uh, January the 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th. January 27th, that's a Thursday through that Sunday. And uh, I'll be giving you more information about that. It's more of a regional meeting, a regional meeting instead of the national meeting. But it will be uh, occupied 2022, January 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th. We've got some exciting things that I'll announce about that uh, in the coming weeks. So uh, those of you that can control your work calendars and get off and on those days, uh, please do that it's on a Thursday and Friday or Saturday, whenever you work. I'd love to see full participation from our congregation uh, for this gathering. So please uh, do that, and I'll share more information about that. And then also make a note of this um, first fruit offering for 2022 will be the last Sunday in January, which is January 20, January 30th. January 30th will be our first fruit offering, one week salary. So you've got October, November, December, you've got four months. Four months, okay? We all want to come in and give us a first fruit, guard our seat for the rest of the year, one week's income. We've done it last year, we're doing it in this year. I think it's going to be even bigger. But you've got all of October, November, December, January. To trust God's supernatural provision, to walk in obedience in your money management, and to get yourself positioned to sow this seed for your life, your family, your loved ones. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a great harvest on uh, January the 30th. Let us stand and, and leave. Anything else, Pastor Mark? Okay, we're good. Have you all got information out there? Uh, for cancer uh, and domestic abuse. There's information for you to take hold of and uh, it's for you and it's for other people. Okay, we want to serve other people with this information. So as you 
wholeheartedly to do that. So good to see all of you. Just make your way to one person you haven't seen in a long time. Just say hello to them. Bless their heart, okay? Just for you to do that. Bless my heart to see us moving in community in that level. But don't try to rush out. Just And really, we don't like leaving before benediction or before um, uh, we leave. And, uh, so let's make sure we're doing that in the future. But at least speak to one person you haven't seen in, in months, maybe even a year or so, okay? Father, as we depart this place, we depart loved by you, covered, kept, and protected by you. We leave God being instruments in your hand to, uh, to demonstrate your supernatural di- uh, dimension, to articulate your supernatural dimension through great awareness. So, Father, move through us, move in us, grace us to be oh so ready when you move through us or move in someone's life to come to us. Let us give what we have, knowing that it is enough. In you. Whatever it is, it is enough, God. So I thank you and just declare increase for our lives, for your glory, for your kingdom's sake. God bless you. And again, those of you who'd like to become members of the body of Christ, come and join. And those of you that would like to come and join the ministry, come as well. God bless you. Love you with the love of the Lord. Take care. Peace. Thank you.